Paul, uh, I'm Roger Berkowitz, uh, director of the RN Center, and thank you for coming to this lunchtime talk. Uh, our speaker today, as many of you know, is Robert Pogue Harrison, who is the Rosina Perotti Professor in Italian Literature at Stanford University. Um, he's written many books, and he's widely followed by many of our students for his uh, radio and webcasts. Uh, and so I've heard about him really through my students first, which uh, who take my courses on Heidegger and Arendt and Nietzsche, and then come and say, well, actually, this guy at Stanford is saying something else, or saying something similar. Um, but I listened to some of his podcasts recently on Hannah Arendt, and I was struck by the uh, clarity of vision and um, and beauty with which he wrote, uh, talking about Arendt's commitment to thinking and um, and, and solitude, uh, topics that some of you know are dear to my heart in writing and thinking about Hannah Arendt. And so when Adam told me that Robert was going to be here and Joe had invited him to speak on Nietzsche, um, I asked and he graciously agreed to come and do double duty and uh, give us a short talk on, on passionate thinking in Hannah Arendt which will then, we hope, lead into a, a wide-ranging discussion. He talks about gardens. This is his most recent book on gardens, uh, um, about planting the seeds of thinking in, in one's soul, and uh, on death, the meaning of death, and many other things. So um, I look forward to hearing it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Roger, for the invitation. I am uh, happy and honored to be in, this, in the center in Hannah Arendt's um, desk and visited her grave earlier today. Uh, thanks to Adam. Took us there. So the, um, what I had in mind today is to do something in the Arendtian sphere, which is more dialogical than monological, because I read Roger's piece on solitude and thinking in Hannah Arendt, and I realized that there was a lot of um, uh, overlap and, and sympathy between our, our, what interests me, at least, uh, in Hannah Arendt, which is her very rich and enfolded concept of thinking and how thinking relates to um, all sorts of phenomena that you wouldn't necessarily associate with, the, with thinking. Uh, friendship, for example. The realm of the, the civic, the police. Uh, citizenship. And then, of course, uh, philosophy. And I would actually like some help in trying to see if I can uh, make full sense of how she presumes to um, negotiate the role that thinking plays in these different domains where uh, it has different registers and different motivations, not to say different outcomes. So one article of hers that I've been um, especially taken with is this article of philosophy and politics that I uh, came across a reference to um, when I was looking up Hannah Arendt in the index under the rubric of friendship. And this is an article that was uh, part of three lectures that she gave at Notre Dame in 1954, and it's the third part. And I think it's only been published, as far as I know, in um, this journal of social research in the spring of 1990. And here she goes back to the question of Socrates um, as a thinker who, um, prior to Plato's co-optation of him, was actually not a philosopher in any Platonic sense, but was someone who believed that the vocation of thinking was uh, to be in and among the citizens of his city and to engage in a kind of one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is what the basis of dialectic would be, one-on-one -on -one conversation, the opinions of his fellow citizens. And here, uh, Hannah Arendt makes the, uh, the point that to engage in um, uh, the clarification of the opinions of your fellow citizens, that one uses dialogue in order to uh, clarify things that are not necessarily clear, clear to the person himself or herself in the Greek police obviously himself because it was a strictly male sort of sphere. And that um, he, Socrates did this as a vocation really in a spirit of um, 
affirming the fact that opinions, although there is no ultimate stable foundation for them, the way Plato would subsequently want to provide, use philosophy in order to provide absolute standards for judging of truth, that the realm of opinion does belong to the public realm uh, in a kind of demo democracy where persuasion uh, has a political uh, uh, consequences because you persuade people to uh, a certain kind of consensus about policy. And therefore, the realm of opinion, the, the doxa, the, that which appears also in the public sphere, is something that uh, Socrates took himself to be the kind of the maiutic notion of philosophy, that he's going to be the midwife who brings out latent um, uh, uh, opinions in, in his fellow men by in, engaging in conversations that would, again, clarify that. And Hannah Arendt says that this sort of um, maiutics or dialectics was uh, an attempt on the part of Socrates to turn the citizens of Athens into uh, a community of friends, because it's with friends that one thinks through certain issues without necessarily coming to conclusions. And this lack of this um, form that dialogue between friends takes that doesn't come to definitive conclusion is how we should understand Plato's early dialogues, which themselves are based on this dialectic of question and answer, and many of his early dialogues end in an inconclusive uh, uh, moment where you're really left to think, the reader is left to think of his or her own about what has been raised. So thinking through a particular topic or a particular opinion is... Uh, has a political consequences, obviously, for Socrates, but it's also, uh, again, this turning the citizens into friends in a context where the Greek Athenian population was extremely agonistic and rivalrous and envy, and that it was not necessarily the case that friendship was at all um, what characterized the relations between citizens and Athens. So uh, this idea that through Thinking together, one can um, create a community of friends, which is not a pre-given, it's, uh, it's something that obviously she approves of greatly. And she believes, in, she goes on in this article to say that it's the trial of Socrates, which of course was the big crisis in, um, for philosophy and for Plato, that the trial and condemnation of Socrates by his fellow citizens has the same sort of importance in the history of philosophy as, as the uh, crucifixion of, of um, Jesus does in Christianity, because what uh, Socrates' failure to persuade the jury of his own innocence and his subsequent condemnation horrified his disciples and Plato and made them despair of the police as being a place where philosophy could ever really root itself or be at home, and therefore mm, she argues that with Plato there's this... Uh, very aggressive and deliberate attempt to, to divorce philosophy from uh, the political, and then to propose that philosophy be the new um, sort of foundation for the city, because if philosophy did not take control of power, then there would be no guarantee that, it's, that the police would ever remember the philosopher, and, and that therefore the immortality and the, and the glory of the philosopher would, would uh, uh, be consigned to oblivion. Therefore, he writes the Republic as an attempt to show that um, the, the city is founded on mere opinion, divorcing opinion from truth, and that uh, and creating all these distinctions that subsequently would go throughout the whole um, history of philosophy up through, you know, for her Heidegger and beyond, I suppose. And then it takes a very interesting turn, and this is where I'd like to you know, approach the question of passionate thinking, because from uh, this idea of citizens engaging in dialogue with one another, she goes on to say that the only way uh, one can really think with another is if oneself, one's, uh, as an individual, is already uh, a thinking subject where I am in dia dialogue with myself, in my solitude. No? And therefore, 
the precondition that's, and I'd be happy to be corrected if Roger, for example, disagrees, but the way I read it is that the precondition for a thoughtful interchange with my friend or my fellow citizen is that I am two in one and that I am constant dialogue with myself in terms of uh, a thinking dialogue. And here she points I, along the way in something very interesting that as opposed to the Kantian categorical imperative about, she says, Socrates did not have a concept of conscience per se, but he does say, the reason that you don't want to commit a murder is because would you like to live the rest of your life with a murderer? Because that's who, that's who you will spend the rest of your life with. And if you don't believe that murder is an honorable thing, don't think that just because no one knows that you committed a murder that you're not going to have to pay a price for it because you're going to have to be your own friend in yourself and you're going to have to know that you're a murderer and that if you are at all honest with yourself you will not want to uh, share the rest of your life with a murderer. So this idea that thinking begins in a dialogue with oneself, it's something that then leads her to... Uh, uh, raise the question of what happens under totalitarian regimes, and I know that Roger has written on this very persuasively in the, in the, the Thinking in Dark Times, about where, in her um, understanding, the, the one of the main objectives of totalitarian regimes is to uh, blot out any possibility of solitude among the citizens, to drown it out, primarily, I guess, through propaganda, but always hearing in your head um, some kind of propaganda that prevents this dialogue of the self with itself, this thinking dialogue to take place. And insofar as such regimes successfully uh, preclude the possibility of a, of a think of solitude, of solitude in which that kind of thinking takes place, they can create the conditions for loneliness. This is something that I, I learned, again, from Roger, that there's this difference between loneliness and solitude, and I'm not absolutely clear about why in, under totalitarian regimes, it's a condition of loneliness, which equals a condition of thoughtlessness, which then enables the regimes, you know, to uh, uh, to totalize their power over the citizenry. Um, that this then um, reminds us that thinking in this space of solitude is one of the most crucial guarantees of a certain kind of political or a certain kind of freedom that will resist uh, uh, coercion in a political sense. And there, of course, we can't help but think of what she had to say about Eichmann and that his, the banality of his evil was that he was basically a thoughtless person. He was incapable of thinking because he never had that dialogue with himself and because he could never see anything from anyone's pers perspective but his own. And therefore, this failure of imagination to have a pluralized view of things uh, lead, you know, leads to a, um, a kind of, it's not only failure of imagination, but it's failure of thinking. And that therefore it's the extreme thoughtlessness of someone like Eichmann that is the condition for the evil that could be done. And this means that he did not have any kind of dialogue with himself. Now, all that is excellent so far because we can build a political philosophy on it, we can build a whole theory of thinking, and, and this, the meat sign of Heidegger, and, and that we're all together in a world where we help each other uh, verbalize our opinions and our ideas, and, our, and, and that in so doing, we make sure that we don't succumb to uh, dogmas and to ideologies in the bad sense and so forth. But then she raises this question about the philosopher in the platonic sense, is a different sort of creature than most uh, uh, most other people because the philosopher is someone who experiences uh, the shock of wonder before the very existence of the world. And this uh, state of wonder, which is what Plato and Aristotle ascribe the origins of philosophy to is one that um, is fundamentally uh, an experience of something that about which you cannot form opinions so there's no doxa possible 
in a state of wonder. You can only basically understand it in terms of... Um, uh, well, let me read to you what she says here. That We have to... Uh, there's two statements where Plato defines the origin of philosophy. Wonder is what the philosopher endures most. And this idea that the philosopher endures a state of wonder is a pathos, therefore it's a passion. And so this is where passionate thinking comes into, into play. Uh, for there is no other beginning of philosophy than wonder. And the second occurs in his seventh letter when Plato talks about those things which to him are the most serious ones, that is, not so much philosophy as we understand it, as its eternal topic and end. Of this, he says, it is altogether impossible to talk about this as about other things we learn. Rather, from much being together with the thing, a light is lit as from a flying fire. And she says, in these two statements, we have the beginning and end of the philosopher's life, which the cave story of Plato omits. So, this thaumazane, this state of wonder, is one that is, uh, causes the philosopher to ask these hugely generic questions like what is being, what is man, what meaning does life have, what is death, uh, all of which have in common that they cannot be answered scientifically. But insofar as they are unanswerable questions, she claims the answerable questions of science have their foundation in these unanswerable questions of philosophy. But what is so uh, intriguing to me is that this state of wonder is one that reduces the philosopher ultimately to a condition of silence and speechlessness because there's something that cannot be said about the... Uh, there's something non-transitive about the experience of wonder where the philosopher is experiencing this singularity of himself or herself as if at the moment of death. And this... Um, is intriguing to say the least because it seems to be a moment that takes the thinking outside of the political, outside of the realm of friendship, and outside even of the moment of the thinking dialogue with myself. Uh, and yet it seems yet to be also foundational somehow for Hannah Arendt that this moment of wonder uh, is is what is the beginning and end of, of philosophy as such, post-Socratic philosophy to be sure, although Socrates was famous for falling into these trances. Those of you who have read the symposium will remember that he fall, he won't go into Agathon's for uh, an hour or so because he, he's had this mystical trance where he is, that moment of wonder has overtaken him, and he can't talk about what he's seeing. It's, it's beyond speech. And of course, Logos is the very currency of, of the political for Hannah Arendt. And then, so then she goes on to say the following, and I'll conclude um, very shortly. She says that the difference between the philosophers, who are few, and the multitude is by no means, as Plato already indicated, that the majority knows nothing of the passion of wonder, the pathos of wonder, but much rather that they refuse to endure it. And this refusal is, is expressed in Doxazain, informing opinions on matters about which man cannot hold opinions because the common and commonly accepted standards of common sense do not here apply. Doxa, in other words, could become the opposite of truth because Doxazain is indeed the opposite of Thaumazain. And uh, so this willingness to endure the passion of wonder is, um, I think, intimately connected to her concept of passionate thinking, which she talks about in, in her experience of being a Heidegger student in the 20s, when all of a sudden this rumor started spreading all around, um, I guess Freiburg, that thinking had come alive again in Heidegger seminars. And in fact, people were, were uh, you know, leave, leaving Husserl's seminars, and they were all kind of crowding into Heidegger. Because there was a sense of passionate thinking, which uh, she speaks of again as an enduring, that uh, Heidegger's passionate thinking was allowing the tradition, the past, you know, to come alive again. She speaks about all of a sudden, you know, the, the past uh, 
the history of philosophy had come alive again in the presence of the philosopher who was bringing it alive. Therefore, we were talking about the Middle Ages, and Heidegger, you, he could teach Duns Scotus, or he could teach Aristotle, or Thomas Aquinas, whatever it is, and retrieve the unspoken and reanimate the past. And, and this, for her, was a, a, exactly what she understood as passionate thinking, and, and we can imagine her as a student feeling the pathos and herself uh, being overcome by this passion, and uh, regardless of whether she went on to have an affair with Heidegger or not, but obviously it, it's, it has to be some connection about this thinking that happens as a state of wonder, where the past now all of a sudden is, is, is speaking in a, in a live voice. Uh, and this inability to speak about what that wonder is is, is also something that uh, I just thought I would throw out there as um, a question that we might be able to discuss about uh, how, in a certain sense, untypical it is upon an iron to uh, do a certain apologia of a state of wonder which is beyond speech and beyond human relations and beyond uh, certainly the political sphere it seems and you know where does it where does it leave uh, any kind of theory of, of, of her notion of thinking as a whole so I will uh, suspend my opening remarks there well, thank you. Um, I see Karen already. Is Let's pause for one second. Um, he's got to get going in 34 minutes. Okay. Just so we can keep track of that. Okay, perfect. I'll keep track, but just so we're aware. I, I want to go too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you're thinking, when you're talking at both about um, Hunter Arndt's conception of a dialogue, not just between two different people, but within the self, and then when you're talking about wonder, from what I understand, you're saying she kind of roots this in Plato, but it's making me think more of Augustine than of Plato, and I'm trying to understand that. I mean, it, it just because I mean, in Augustine, it's so clear kind of the process where he talks about this. So where, where exactly is it in in Plato? You know, the kind of the inner dialogue or wonder. I'm just kind of wondering. Well, the wonder is one thing. It is in Plato where he says mm-hmm. that the the origins of philosophy are in wonder, and I can give you the. I think it's a Theotius, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then the other is the seventh letter, which some people still contest having been authored by Plato, but there he talks about how I have never committed any of my real thinking to writing, because what I, what the, the matter itself, the pragma auto, is, is something that's beyond speech, and it's only through, this is actually interesting, because I, I write about that in gardens in, in, I have a chapter on Plato's Academy, and he thought that this this thing itself, it's only through living together as a community of <clears throat> teacher and student, and a continuous dialogue between teacher and student, that all of a sudden, then a stu- it'll be born, uh, a spark will fly, and the student will finally get it. It'll be beyond speech, beyond language, but dialogue or conversation, this ongoing conversation in the Academy is something that that uh, will um, maybe enable it to ignite. Um, and is that spark when it shifts to not just being a dialogue between two people, but within the self? Yes. Is that? Yeah. One can read this in the Republic as well. I mean, you can read the Republic as sort of a contest between Glaucon, who keeps saying, tell us what justice is, and Socrates keeps saying, I can't, I can't, until finally in the cave, you know, parable at the end, you know, he's sort of pointing to these three uh, idolon, these little images of the jo- of the good now, and, and saying, well, I can't take you any further, and God says, please take me further. Mm-hmm. And Socrates is saying, eventually you have to see it for yourself. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you can really see the idea of wonder on the outside played in the Republic as well. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know it's not very original to d- try to detect dodginess when Heidegger comes up, but what is the difference between wonder and, and enchantment? And what is the difference between wonder and enchantment and not thinking. In other words, in a totalitarian society, the, the goal of the rulers is, of course, to enchant people to the extent that they all that they all stop thinking. And you were saying the real loneliness is, when, is, is, is the thoughtless person, but isn't it the other way around? The real loneliness in such circumstances is the one person who actually does try and think for himself and uh, is thus not only in real, real danger, but cast out of the community of enchantment. And Heidegger, I think one of the, 
links people's pockets. Sometimes, I'm not an expert, but the make between Heidegger's philosophy and his own enchantment with Nazism was uh, perhaps not even the best example of him trying to think. Yes, you know, I think Roger could speak better about loneliness than, than I can, because I, she makes a distinction between loneliness and solitude. And right. the, it's the solitary thinker who is the one who's doing the thinking, whereas loneliness does, is not particularly hospitable to thinking, if I, if I get it right. Is that, is that how you see it, too? Yeah. So loneliness is, um, it, it can be, you, you can be in the midst of a, of a huge crowd or a mass or a, it could, loneliness and what you're calling enchantment could go very well together in, uh, in her understanding. That's right. I mean, loneliness for her is, in a sense, a definition of enchantment. Um, it's, to be, um, it's to be so... They're both... Loneliness is rooted, rooted in what she calls rootlessness, uh, which is certainly taken from Heidegger to a certain extent, uh, although I don't want to say directly, you know, without any change. But rootlessness, in which one is uprooted from one's, you know, traditions and homes and customs, leads one to be lonely in the sense of needing to reaffirm oneself to uh, a coherent narrative of the world to give it meaning. And so the lonely person is the one who's most of a joiner uh, in movements and in enchantments, as I think you would call them. Um, whereas a person in solitude is one who stands back from all movements and all uh, engagements and, uh, uh, and thinks for oneself with oneself. That, if that helps. Yeah, it seems, seems an odd definition of loneliness, though, because surely the lonely person is the one who feels uh, without, utterly alone and cast out of the community, whereas the solitary person can, it's a temporary state of somebody who can still be very much part of the community. Who wrote the book The Lonely American Crowd? Oh, the Lonely Crowd. David Reisman. Re 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 she takes her definition of loneliness <clears throat> largely from Reisman. The lonely person is the one who's rootless, lonely, and seeking connection. And seeking connection becomes part of a mass, is the word she would use. Right? Mm -hmm. Robert. Mm -hmm. I'd like to follow up on Ian's question. Um, I think it's a beautiful image, and you know, very clearly well presented, this idea of passionate thinking as an event, something to endure, the idea of pathos and... <clears throat> not for everyone, for the true philosopher, and it, it sense at odds with common sense. But my question about it is a similar question I have to Nietzsche's critique of Kant's categorical imperative, in that, yes, you can expose the holes in it, but is it kind of like democracy and capitalism, the best that we have? In other words, for all its faults, what are you going to replace it with? Isn't reason a good place to go in terms of basing moral decisions? Because... It seems this idea of passionate thinking does open up the potential for passion to replace thinking and for a slide into ideology in that if you really, you know, once you remove the kind of rational ground and it becomes about the investment of, of, of passion and, and all these things, can it then open the door for the kind of um, suasion and non-thinking that, that Ian sort of suggested? You know, it's, it's, it may be sometimes it's good to cool the passions, as it were, and, 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 and with something as socially and politically uh, resonant as, as the kind of thinking she's describing here. Well, what I respond to in Hannah Arendt's uh, thinking on this topic is that she makes it very clear that this kind of philosophical wonder is apolitical and it's... Um, you're, you cannot found a, a state on it, even though Plato wanted to. And it's a big misunderstanding. And I think Heidegger here is, is implicit because his mistakes, politically speaking, she sees in the grand tradition of the philosopher whose thinking, which is he's asking of ultimate questions, cannot be uh, reduced to opinion. They can't be politically negotiated, and therefore they're, they're really doomed to remain outside of the political sphere, and they should remain outside of the political sphere. So I don't think she would encourage trying to uh, create the new republic on the basis of, of these things. Heidegger's misunderstanding 
yeah, I think in, from her point of view was just like Plato's that he could you know go to Dionysus in Sicily and, and maybe uh, translate his uh, theory of the, the philosopher ruler into a reality. But that's a misunderstanding if you read her on how this experience of wonder take, severs all your connections with the uh, fellow men and perhaps even yourself. And I, I know for a fact that Heidegger's whole concept of angst and being in time is taking over Thalmazain uh, from Aristotle even more than Plato and saying that, yes, this is what wonder is, a state of dread, where all of a sudden uh, all my um, coordinates of my identity and, and, and everything is, is put into, uh, into a crisis. And I, I hear that hear the call of my own death and melody, but what can you do with that politically? What's up? Politics belongs to opinion, doxa, uh, negotiation, consensus building, and yeah, I think so. I think she's warning us against the, the, trying to politicize wonder. Um, I think this sort of follows on that in an odd way. Um, it struck me in your, in your presentation of sort of Arendt's take on these these two forms of thinking, more political and more philosophical, that um, your account of the um, a political thinking through together of uh, friendship almost seemed to drain some of the passion that I usually associate with Arendt on that form of um, thinking out of it. Like, um, and it, it actually didn't come across as quite as rhetorical as... I think I I often get from art. Maybe it's just maybe it's just this essay that kind of pulls you in that direction. So I, I just wanted to ask you about that, about the passions that are invested in um, that are engaged in the exchange of opinions, the debate, which is the sine qua non of politics for Arendt, and you know maybe even thinking a little bit about some of what she says in the lectures on on judgment in comparing the, the forming of an opinion to um, uh, an aesthetic judgment. The, the political opinion is like the judgment of beauty, which is t- completely rooted in feeling. It's the feeling of pleasure that, that you take um, in anticipating the agreement of others, even when you can't uh, demand it. You can only woo it through this, uh, this rhetorical um, aspect of your speech. It's a tough question, I have to say, because the, it's true that when she's talking about the kind of thinking, the dialectic between friends um, that characterizes an exchange of opinions, or thinking through on the level of books, uh, that this is associated with friendship, which, of course, is not, for her, uh, the sphere of love. And love is more intense, and so I think you were saying that there's something kind of de, de-intensified about the, the account of, of dialogue between friends that, that I presented. Is that it? I, just, just, I guess it's more of a question of how you see um, the, pa- the passions as right. um, fitting within that account of political speech right. as a dialogue between friends. And granted, her account of love is very specific and um, is... You know, she's very interested in insisting upon the, the how the intensity of passions in a, a love relationship are themselves depolarizing. The kind of distance that you need in order to actually have a debate is, is sort of destroyed by the closeness in romantic love. So friendship has more distance, I would imagine, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a kind of a, a passionate dimension to that form of thinking. And I just wonder how if you entertained the passionate side, the, the passionate dimensions of that side of thinking, right. how it might compare with or fit differently with yeah. the passion that you're describing in, in wonder, in the philosopher's point of thinking. Well, clearly, the, um, when she speaks about passionate thinking, she's using the word passion, uh, re- returning it to its root in a kind of passivity. So I don't want to say it's the opposite of the vita activa. It's not the opposite of... of the active life, which is the political life, but there is something that already signals in the word itself that this is a kind of uh, thinking that is not part of the, you know, the agora. It's not part of the 
the public sphere where you in the, and the kind of exchange of opinions among friends is something that has a political uh, context if not subtext to it and therefore it's part of the active life and whether passionate thinking can be part of the active life or not I'm not sure I would probably suspect that she wants to keep it separate from the from the active life but I don't know what well it's actually I think this is really interesting and important because you asked before how untypical of Hannah Arendt to do an apologia for um, you know a speechlessness right. and yet you know, in the human condition, we're told that there's three um, conditions without which humans are not humans. There's labor, work, and action. And then we're told that there's a fourth, thinking, which is what she's going to do, but is not one that is part of that. Not one that you, not one that is that 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 is so central that we're going to talk about it as part of the Vita Activa. And yet, she also wants to say it's active in a very important way. And there's a, and, and this, you know, I think always has to raise a question of, well, if thinking is part of the active life of some people, why is it not the active life of all? And there's a certain chosenness, uh, elitism, may we say, about those who are going to be able to avoid dox, doxazane yeah. and actually endure thalmazane, which is not going to be all but the thinkers. Um, and that brings us back to, in a way, Ian's question of, you know, it's the few people who hold out this realm of thinking that stand as a bulwark against um, conformity and, uh, and doxa becoming uh, uh, overwhelming in a certain way. Yeah, certainly there's... Uh she says that everyone is capable of these moments of passionate thought, but the difference between the philosopher and the most of others is that we, the rest of us, let's say we're not philosophers, refuse to endure it. We refuse to suffer it, and therefore we flee into the realm of opinion. And this makes it, uh, maybe this could be Hannah Arendt getting some inspiration about the, from categories being in time like authenticity, versus inauthenticity, because uh, authenticity is largely speechless, no? Yeah. And it only occurs in these moments, the kind of the blink, the, the moment of vision, as Heidegger calls, and then you fall back into the inauthentic. And uh, how can you, you know, build a community around authenticity? Well, in a certain sense, it's... it's uh, and here, the... the um, she, she says that men not only exist in the plural, as do all earthly beings, but have an indication of this plurality within themselves. And this idea that there's uh, that plurality is, is what um, I find a little bit difficult to reconcile, that there's a two-in-one in solitude, but that when it comes to the, the moment of, of intense pathos, of wonder, it seems like even that self is uh, it gets singularized and it, it loses its doubleness. In fact, that's why I would say that loneliness would might one way to conceive of loneliness is that the dot the two in one of solitude has now become a one, and therefore it's thoughtless because you cannot think in the singular from one point of view. But from, when it comes to wonder. Well, maybe wonder isn't even a form of thought. I mean, maybe it's just a, an experience, but you, you are also reduced to a singularity. And I think it, it's the, the two-in-one is abrogated equally in the moment of Thalmazane as it is in the moment of loneliness. So that's where I find it kind of... I, I'm not clear on how, yeah, how she would answer that herself. I, so I'm sorry I can't answer it more to your sense. I just wanted to put another form of speech on the table called poetry. Yes. She loves the poets and has great resort to them. Uh, someone came here and gave a talk about the German edition of the human condition, where she quotes a lot more poets because she's so immersed in German poetry. And I, one line of poetry came to my mind, Wallace Stevens ends a poem by saying, We must endure our thoughts all night until the bright obvious stands motionless and cool. It's the snowman. Uh, and then I think of Nietzsche saying, I love a poet who can think, a Pinder or a Leopardi. 
So, uh, is it possible that a human, a deeply human response to the wonder is not silence or a sense of impossibility of speech, but praise and poetry? And that uh, it's a, it too is a, a, a kind of, a, of speaking that has to be thought about in relation to the political, to uh, the smaller community, maybe uh, the audience for the poem, um, and uh, even the solitude in which the poem is conceived. So it would be a, a just a, a tertium quid along with uh, uh, philosophy and political thought, as to speak of poetry. I also remember you're using the word narrative, and uh, poetry, insofar as it contains narrative, is the Homer is often the way of um, binding a fragmented psyche back together, as with combat veterans. And psychologists often speak of how we make narratives about ourselves, but of a, a severe condition in some people where they cease to be able to do that itself. They cannot make a coherent narrative about their life. So I guess I'm talking about poetry as praise, and uh, narrative as healing, as intertwined things. Take this as the last question. Well, we'll, we'll One more, okay. Just what means, please have his hand up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is that because, we, because of the training? It, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, we, it takes a while to get there. Yeah, but as like final remarks and whatever. But we'll see. We'll play. One forty-five. Yeah, respond and. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, do you want to understand? Uh, yes, I think that I, I think that she would agree with you that in, ultimately poetry would be the, the kind of uh, the language that comes closest to transcribing. If you, that's not the wrong metaphor. The state of wonder and it's looking at the world and, and leaving the unanswerable questions. It's, it's making room for them, and, and, and the reader of the poem does not uh, you know, think through to a conclusion. It's just the wonder is there. And in that sense, I think she would probably even say that prayer is a, another form of, uh, of that of being open to the wonder, uh, the ultimate mystery or something. The, Narrative, I think, is a little bit more complicated, only because narrative, if you follow the classical Aristotelian rules of it, it tells stories in uh, with begin, beginning, middle, and end, and there's a plot that resolves itself so that from the perspective of the end, everything falls into place and makes sense. And this sort of um, organization that uh, narrative brings to bear on experience or on time is something that might um, uh, distance the experience of wonder or domesticate it by giving it configurations that obey laws of logic yeah. as n narratives tend to do as unlike poetry does certain kinds of poetry don't necessarily are, are not um, held to that same standard of configure configurative form. I think some people uh, say that Socrates was one of the few people who managed to finish his own life script. Yeah. That usually you have to watch someone die and then you tell the story from the point of view of the end of it, which gives it final meaning. But that he decided to bait the jury till he died. They killed him so that he could have the last word. That's a, I'm persuaded by that. I think Leo Strauss has that interpretation. It's uh, through Xenophon. Uh, apology for that the Straussians take it. Oh, right. Well, the Brahmins, even, even Socrates is only Socrates through Plato and through Xenophon and through the narratives that one tells about him, which are conflicting, not, not unitary. Yeah, I think the Xenophon's memorabilia of Socrates are much underrated if we're giving vital perspective. You know. Well, what she yeah. claims is that Socrates made the mistake of his trial of using dialectic with the jury, mm -hmm. and this was just uh, doomed to failure because it's not the kind of method of, of, for persuasion, because dialectic is not about persuasion, mm -hmm. it's about clarification, and they got really pissed off at, at this method. And, and Xenophon says, implies that he spoke very proudly because he wanted to die, and he wanted to piss them off, and uh, so he wasn't really making the mistake. Exactly, I, I'm kind of persuaded. But coming to the end, the, the last... Uh, 
act of Socrates, according to apocryphal stories, that you know he was learning uh, some a melody on the flute mm-hmm. and trying to learn it. And his disciple said, "But Socrates, what possible good will it do you to learn this melody as they're preparing the hemlock?" And uh, he doesn't have an answer to that question. But for me, it's it's the like, yeah, it embodies a sense that the learning, the ultimate teacher's lesson is that the learning process is an end in itself and that you learn things just right up until the time you die not because they're going to serve some purpose beyond themselves but just because it's, it's, a, it's learning uh, yeah, I, yeah, hopefully it'll be quick um, yes, please. yeah, wonder, wonder is something that I've thought about a lot and I think a lot about more um, I guess I see very different moments of wonder that that we don't really have different words for, um, that I think are important to distinguish. One is is sort of what Plato, I think, talks about in the Theotetus, as wonder at, at what you don't understand, and this feeling that that I that I can't make sense of this, and that sort of that gives birth to a, a desire to understand and try to figure it out. Um, but oftentimes, the, I feel like the process that you go through to figure out almost produces its own sense of wonder and, and that once we once we can take what we didn't understand and now sort of have a place for it, everything clicks in and we have this this sense of everything belonging where it is. Um, and I guess my question would be how, how do you feel that wonder um, can, can wonder sort of lead to a sense of place or rootedness um, as a co- combating the sense of rootlessness or, or loneliness can wonder actually make us feel committed to experience well Heidegger certainly thought so because he believed that uh, and when he writes on Hörderlin's homecoming elegy it's clear that the only way you can really become at home at home is if you listen to the voice of a poet who has traveled afar and has estranged himself and, and comes back with tidings from basically death or the angels or, but you have to be attuned to something that's outside of your outside of your homeland and it's only through a process of estrangement from the homeland that you actually can be at home there for the first time mm-hmm. and that would probably connect it to some kind of uh, experience of, of if not wonder then certainly an estrangement that's very close to the state of wonder I would imagine yeah mm-hmm. so um, and certainly Hannah Arendt's you know Biography would seem to confirm that this sort of estrangement, uh, of homelessness and rootlessness, is something that enabled her to, uh, you know, find the kind of roots she did in thinking and to be the kind of thinker she she was. Can I ask one last quick one or not? Yeah. Go. I I, I want to, in a sense, pursue that with this question of, that Ian was asking before about the dangers of her thought. Yeah. Um, to the extent there is. And I think one of the ways to do that is to look at her most controversial essay, The Little Rock, The Little Rock, Black, is on Little Rock which is very much, um, as far as I've read the essay, an attempt to say, if thinking in solitude, which is, as you said, non-political or apolitical, pre-political, it's the prerequisite, you know, requires that in solitude we allow people to think terrible thoughts. We allow them to become rooted, to become wonder and become racist, become uh, whoever they are in their root, and then enter the public world as that person who can then disagree and, and argue as friends in a, in a policy. And so she makes the case that you have to let prejudices be prejudices in the private sphere uh, and not impose your um, so social and political ideas of equality in, in, in that private sphere. Because you have to risk letting people develop in sort of horrible, but also great ways in order to create people who think and therefore can oppose um, the social at some point. And I'm just wondering, A, if that's how you read her, and B, do you agree? I mean, is that is that is that risk of letting the private be much more uh, extreme something that you think is important as you're in your, in your idea of passionate thinking? Well, the way I read that Little Rock essay is um, more about, it's, a, it's the only 
a place in her corpus known to me where the social is not this blob and this negative thing that she redeems the value of the social by connecting it to the freedom of association. And uh, the private sphere is not does not have that freedom of association because you are born into your family and the kin and, and you're in a certain sense condemned to them. And it, it's a sphere of idiosyncrasy. And that idiosyncrasy can take the form of racism and but it's you know, it's that private sphere, it's okay, because it's not the public sphere, which is the sphere of equality before the law. Now, this social thing is very interesting because in that she defends the rights of um, uh, Jews to go to all Jewish clubs or resorts, or if you know, if I want to go to a resort which is all Jew, or the, for the the you know the the you know the racist to go to an all white uh, association or something. So, and she believes that the freedom of association is has to be cherished and defended, and that's why she defended uh, you know the the segregation laws. Uh, of the, well, the, the, the anti-integration, yeah. not the segregation, but right. the end. And she said, now, when it comes to the question of the law with the public, then it's m much worse that there, there were still, um, the intermarriage between blacks and whites was not forbidden by law. And whereas, you know, the freedom of was association by law. was forbidden yeah. by law. And um, so the idea of the social sphere as the sphere of discrimination I think is a very interesting concept because discrimination can have a positive valence, it can have a negative one. That's right. Because you discriminate against, but you're also discriminating uh, because you're selective. And we need to be able to choose our friends through a freedom of association that where uh, I don't, I personally don't want to be dictated in this sphere of who, um, you know, who I associate and who I don't associate with. And, that, and I think she understood that it's a very a crucial aspect, and of course, um, I, I do believe that in the United States we run the risk of, of uh, over policing the social sphere because, precisely for the reasons that I understand through our Arendtian concept of politics, which is that there are so many failures in the political sphere on the part of the left in America uh, just because we just can't get it, you know, it's a different game, we don't play it well, things like that, and therefore there's this. Uh, in, aggressive colonization of the, let's say, call it the social sphere, the schools and, you know, uh, movies or things. And therefore, all the failures in the political realm get sometimes transferred into the social, and then the social becomes a, a kind of a place of terrorism, of, of, you know, too too much political correctness, and not enough discrimination in the sense of, well, let me discriminate for myself, you know, who I want to associate with and who I don't want to associate, what I want to think and what, what kind of conversations I can have. What, what can I tell my friends that will, I will not be liable for in the public sphere? So that, that's where technologies, recording technology, cell phones, thing, all of a sudden if I'm having, you know, a personal conversation at a bar with, and then all of a sudden it's on YouTube, it's no, well, that's no longer the social sphere. Now we're talking about the public sphere and it, to be held responsible for everything that one does in the, so, in the social, I think, is asking too much of, uh, of people to, of, of policing and self-policing, because it, it then becomes, rather than an expansive freedom, it becomes the opposite. So you wouldn't have fired John Galliano? Well, he, uh, I, I, I think that that was not a, that was not a, a so, I don't know if that was a social situation, because he made those statements, uh, I think, to strangers. If I were, and that and it was in a, it was in a bar, but yeah, no, I I mean, if you cannot fire him for political reasons or in in the court of law because he has the right to say what he did. You can fire him because he's your employee and you think it's going to cost you in terms of your public image, and which is what happened. But. Um, what did he say? But it, it wasn't John activity and right to speak anti-Semitic. Yeah, in fact, in, yes, in, in fact, France, in France so there's a law. He, yeah. he made some anti-Semitic um, attacks on, on some people at a bar, and it was caught on video. And it, he uh, he said that you know in, in Hitler's days you guys would have been gassed and so forth. And I, I, he, so it was a very aggressive anti-Semitic uh, statements that were made. And he, he has 
serious drug problems and things like that. That's what, but you're right, that France does have a law against um, hate speech or something. Yeah. He's not being sued. I thought he was suing those people. He was fired, but he's not suing it. I, I don't think he's suing anybody. But they are trying to No, no, but he's being tried by the He faced the allegations of, of, an, of illegal activity yes. in France. Right. I don't know if that's... Been and they're actually true. prosecuting him. Right, I see. Okay. Okay. Because their freedom of speech is not protected. No. That kind of speech is not yeah. protected. Hate speech is In America, I think it is. Yes. It would be yes. Yes. Yeah. protected, right? Unless there's an imminent danger of, of violence. Right. Also in England, I believe paradoxically, affirmative action is referred to as positive discrimination. In France, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, we have to let Robert get to his train, but thank him for thank being you so very much to our thinking here.